Previously, we delved into the enigmatic visions of Daniel Chapter 2, a dream of a towering statue, its form composed of varying elements, each representing the succession of earthly kingdoms. We uncovered the intricate tapestry of prophecy and bore witness to the divine hand shaping the course of human history. Now we find ourselves on the threshold of a new revelation. As we turn the page to Daniel chapter 7, we encounter a vision that shadows and illuminates, that cloaks and reveals. A vision filled with beasts that rise from the sea, each more terrifying than the last, each laden with prophetic significance. The echoes of the past still linger, but the path forward calls us. For those who have eyes to see, the visions of Daniel offer a guide, a lantern in the dark shedding light on the grand plan that governs the ages. Prepare to embark on a journey into the heart of prophecy, where symbols speak louder than words, where beasts are kingdoms, and where dreams offer a glimpse into the divine realm. As we venture into this realm of beasts and prophecy, remember the lessons of the statue from Daniel chapter 2. The echoes of its shattered fragments still linger, reminding us of the fleeting nature of earthly kingdoms and the enduring power of the divine. Are you ready to witness the unfolding of prophecy? To stand by Daniel's side as the waves of the great sea churn and the beasts rise? Then gather your courage and steady your heart. The winds of heaven are stirring. In the first year of Belshazzar king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Daniel 7, 1, 3. We are to interpret all scriptural language literally, except when there is a compelling reason to consider it as figurative. Every figurative expression should be explained by its literal counterpart. The language employed here is evidently symbolic, as evident in verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which arise out of the earth. The implication of kingdoms, rather than merely individual kings, is discernible from the phrase, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom. In clarifying verse 23, the angel stated, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. Thus, these beasts symbolize four grand kingdoms. The conditions under which they emerged, as represented in the prophecy, are also articulated in symbolic language. The symbols introduced include the four winds, the sea, four immense beasts, ten horns, and another horn with eyes and a mouth, waging war against God and his people. Our task now is to discern their meanings. In symbolic language, winds signify strife, political upheaval and war, as articulated by the prophet Jeremiah. Thus said the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. Jeremiah 25, 32, 33. The prophet discusses a dispute which the Lord will have with all nations. The strife and commotion generating this devastation is referred to as a great whirlwind. The fact that winds symbolize strife and war is evident within the vision itself. As a result of the winds blowing, kingdoms rise and fall through political conflict. Seas, or waters, when employed as a biblical symbol, denote peoples, nations, and tongues. The angel informed the prophet John the waters which thou saw are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Revelation 17, 15. The symbol of the four beasts is defined for Daniel before the vision concludes. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Verse 17. With this elucidation of the symbols, the vision's scope is unequivocally laid before us. As these beasts signify four kings or kingdoms, we must ask, where do we begin and which four empires are represented? These beasts arise sequentially as they are numbered from the first to the fourth. The final one exists when all earthly events conclude with the ultimate judgment. From Daniel's time until the end of the world's history, there were to be only four universal kingdoms, as we learned from Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the grand image in Daniel 2, interpreted by the prophet 65 years prior. Daniel was still living under the kingdom symbolized by the head of gold. 
The first beast of this vision must, therefore, represent the same kingdom as the head of gold of the grand image, namely Babylon. The other beasts likely symbolize the successive kingdoms depicted by that image. However, if this vision spans essentially the same historical period as the image in Daniel 2, one might question its necessity. Why was the first vision not sufficient? In response, we assert that the history of world empires is revisited time and again to reveal additional characteristics and present further facts and features. It is in this manner that we receive line upon line, according to the scriptures. In chapter 2, only the political aspects of world dominion are illustrated. Here, earthly governments are presented in relation to God's truth and God's people. Their true nature is exposed through symbols of wild and ravenous beasts, thereby providing a more profound understanding of their roles and behaviors. Each subsequent exploration of these empires offers a deeper and richer perspective, allowing us to fully grasp the intricate interplay between divine guidance and human ambition throughout history. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Daniel 7.4 In Daniel's seventh vision, the initial beast that appears to the prophet is a lion. To comprehend the symbolic use of a lion, we can refer to Jeremiah 4, 7, 50, 17, 43, 44. In this particular vision, the lion is portrayed with the wings of an eagle. The emblematic application of wings is vividly depicted in Habakkuk 1, 6, 8, where it is described that the Chaldeans shall fly as the eagle that hastes to eat. From these symbolic representations, we can infer that Babylon was a kingdom of immense strength, and under Nebuchadnezzar's reign, its conquests expanded with remarkable swiftness. However, an era arrived when the wings were plucked. The nation no longer pounced upon its prey, akin to an eagle. The courage and vigor of the lion had vanished. In its stead, a man's heart, feeble, apprehensive, and faint, replaced the formidable strength of a lion. This accurately described the condition of the nation during its final years, as it had grown weak and defeat through indulgence in wealth and luxury. And behold another beast, a second, like to a bear. And it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Daniel 7, 5 Analogous to the image in Daniel 2, this series of symbols reveals a noticeable decline as we progress from one kingdom to the next. The silver of the breast and arms is inferior to the gold of the head, just as the bear is inferior to the lion. Meadow Persia lacked the wealth, splendor, and brilliance of Babylon. The bear raised itself up on one side, signifying the dual nationalities of the Medes and Persians. This fact is also represented by the two horns of the ram in Daniel 8. It is said that the higher horn came up last, and likewise, the bear raised itself up on one side. This prophecy was fulfilled as the Persian division of the kingdom, although emerging later, ultimately attained greater prominence, becoming the dominant force in the nation. The three ribs likely symbolize the three provinces of Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt, which were particularly subjugated by Medo Persia. The command, Arise, devour much flesh, seemingly refers to the invigoration experienced by the Medes and Persians upon the subjugation of these provinces. The nature of this power is aptly depicted by a bear. The Medes and Persians were renowned for their cruelty and rapacity, seizing and plundering the people. The medo persian kingdom persisted from the fall of Babylon under Cyrus until the Battle of Arbela in 331 BC, spanning 207 years. After this I beheld, and lo another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Daniel 7, 6 The third kingdom, Greece, is symbolized by the figure of a leopard. If wings upon the lion represented swiftness in conquest, they would convey the same meaning here. The leopard itself is known for its agility, but this alone was not adequate to portray the nature of the nation in question. It required wings, in addition to its inherent swiftness. Not just two as the lion bore, but four. This imagery suggests an unparalleled velocity of movement, which is historically accurate in the case of the Grecian kingdom. 
The conquests of Greece under Alexander were unrivaled in antiquity for their suddenness and speed. W. W. Tan summarizes his military accomplishments. Alexander was a master of combining various arms. He introduced the world to the advantages of winter campaigning, the importance of relentless pursuit, and the principle of march divided, fight united. He usually marched in two divisions, with one managing the impediments while his own division traveled light. His extraordinary speed was attributed to never putting anything off. The vast distances covered in uncharted territory demanded exceptional organizational skills. Within 10 years, he faced only two significant setbacks. Had a lesser man attempted his achievements and failed, the insurmountable military difficulties of the undertaking would have been widely criticized. The beast had also four heads. The unity of the Grecian Empire endured little longer than Alexander's lifetime. Following his dazzling career, which ended with a fever brought on by a drunken spree, the empire was divided among his four top generals. Cassander ruled Macedonia and Greece in the west. Lysimachus governed Thrace and parts of Asia on the Hellespont and Bosphorus in the north. Ptolemy controlled Egypt, Lydia, Arabia, Palestine, and Coeli Syria in the south. And Seleucus presided over Syria and the remaining eastern dominions of Alexander. By 301 BC, with the demise of Antigonus, the division of Alexander's kingdom into four parts was completed by his generals. These divisions were represented by the four heads of the leopard. Thus, the prophetic words were precisely fulfilled. As Alexander left no suitable heir, why did his vast empire not fragment into innumerable minor pieces? Why did it divide into precisely four parts? The answer lies in the prophecy that foresaw and foretold this outcome. The leopard bore four heads, the rough goat had four horns, and the kingdom was to be divided into four segments, and so it came to pass. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth, it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Daniel 7, 7. The power depicted here is so distinct from all others that inspiration finds no existing creature to serve as its symbol. No combination of hoofs, heads, horns, wings, scales, teeth or nails from any beast in nature would suffice. This power is entirely unlike its predecessors, and its representation is entirely unique, unlike any creature found in the animal kingdom. Verse 7 lays the groundwork for an extensive analysis, but due to space constraints, we must offer a concise overview. This beast corresponds to the fourth division of the great image, the legs of iron. The commentary on Daniel 2.40 provides reasons to identify this power as Rome, and these reasons apply to the current prophecy as well. Rome impeccably embodied the iron portion of the image, and the beast described here. Its unparalleled might and the dread it inspired align perfectly with the prophetic portrayal. The world had never witnessed such a formidable power. It devoured with iron teeth and shattered all obstacles in its path. It crushed nations beneath its unyielding feet. The beast possessed ten horns, which are explained in verse 24 as ten kings or kingdoms that would emerge from this empire. As previously discussed in the commentary on Daniel 2, Rome was divided into ten kingdoms. These divisions have since been referred to as the ten kingdoms of the Roman Empire. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. Daniel 7, 8 Daniel observed the horns with keen interest. An unusual development emerged among them, as another horn, initially small but later more robust than its companions, forced its way upward. This new horn was not satisfied with merely finding a place for itself. It sought to displace others and seize their positions. Consequently, three kingdoms were uprooted. The emergence of a little horn. As we will explore in more detail later, this little horn represents the papacy. The three uprooted horns symbolize the Heruli, Ostrogoths and Vandals whose removal stemmed from their opposition to the doctrines and assertions of the papal hierarchy. This horn possessed eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. 
apt symbols for the astuteness, insight, and audacious claims of a wayward religious institution, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Daniel 7, 9, 10. A more sublime and awe-inspiring scene is scarcely found within the pages of the sacred text. Not only the grand and lofty imagery captivates our attention, but the very nature of the scene itself demands the utmost gravity, as the judgment concerns us all in matters of eternal consequence. The Ancient of Days, God the Father, presides over the judgment. Observe the description of his person. Those who believe in the impersonality of God must concede that he is portrayed here as a personal being, Yet they console themselves by claiming this to be the sole description of its kind in the Bible. We do not accept this latter assertion. However, even if it were true, would not one such description be as detrimental to their belief as if it were repeated twenty times? The innumerable thousands who minister unto him and stand before him are not sinners brought before the judgment seat, but heavenly beings attending to his will. John witnessed the same celestial attendants around the throne of God and described the majestic scene. I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands. Revelation 5.11 A more profound comprehension of these verses requires an understanding of the sanctuary services. The conclusion of Christ's ministry, our great high priest, within the heavenly sanctuary, represents the judgment work introduced here. It is an investigative judgment. The books are opened, and the cases of all are examined before that grand tribunal, determining in advance who shall receive eternal life when the Lord comes to bestow it upon his people. As evident from the testimony of Daniel 8.14, this solemn work is currently underway in the sanctuary above. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. Daniel 7, 11, 12 There exist those who advocate for a thousand-year reign of righteousness before Christ's arrival. Others believe in a period of probation following the Lord's coming, during which the immortal righteous continue to preach the gospel to mortal sinners guiding them towards salvation. Nevertheless, neither of these theories can be substantiated by the scriptures, as we shall demonstrate. The fourth fearsome beast persists, unaltered in nature, while the little horn continues to issue its blasphemies, binding millions of followers in the chains of blind superstition until the beast is consigned to the burning flame. This is not a conversion, but rather its destruction. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 Unlike the preceding beasts whose lives were extended after their dominion ceased, the fourth beast's life is not prolonged. The territories and subjects of the Babylonian, Persian and Grecian kingdoms persisted, albeit subjugated to their successors. However, what follows the fourth kingdom? No mortal government or state succeeds it. Its trajectory culminates in the lake of fire with no existence beyond. The lion transitioned into the bear, the bear into the leopard, and the leopard into the fourth beast. Yet the fourth beast does not amalgamate into another entity. Instead, it is destined for the lake of fire. I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Daniel 7.13 The Son of Man inherits his kingdom. The scene depicted here does not represent the second coming of Christ to earth, for the Ancient of Days is not on this earth, and the arrival mentioned here is directed towards the Ancient of Days. It is in the presence of the Father that dominion, glory, and a kingdom are bestowed upon the Son of Man. Christ acquires his kingdom prior to his return to this earth, 
Luke 19, 10, 12. Thus, this is an event that transpires in heaven, intimately connected with the occurrences delineated in verses 9 and 10. Christ obtains his kingdom upon the completion of his priestly duties in the sanctuary. The people and nations destined to serve him are the redeemed, Revelation 21, 24, not the wicked nations of the earth, for they shall be annihilated at Christ's second coming by the radiance of his arrival. Psalm 2, 9, 2, Thessalonians 2, 8. From all nations, tribes, and kindreds of the earth, those who joyfully serve God shall emerge. They are the ones who will inherit the kingdom of our Lord. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by, and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me, and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom, and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Daniel 7.15, 18 Our concern for comprehending these truths should be no less profound than Daniel's. We can be assured that when we inquire with genuine sincerity, we will discover the Lord is as prepared today as he was in the days of the prophet to guide us toward a correct understanding of these significant truths. The beasts and their corresponding kingdoms have been explicated already. We have accompanied the prophet through a series of events, culminating in the annihilation of the fourth beast and the ultimate collapse of all terrestrial governments. Subsequently, the narrative transitions as we learn that the saints shall take the kingdom, verse 18. The saints often derided, reproached, persecuted and cast out, deemed the least likely among all ever to realize their aspirations, are the ones who shall seize the kingdom and possess it eternally. The wicked's usurpation and maladministration shall cease. The inheritance lost due to sin shall be reclaimed. Peace and righteousness shall perpetually preside over the vast expanse of the renewed earth. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spoke very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Daniel 719 20 Daniel possessed a lucid understanding of the first three beasts in this vision. However, the fourth beast astonished him due to its unnatural and fearsome nature. It was primarily concerning this beast and its ten horns, particularly the last emerging little horn, whose look was more stout than his fellows, that he sought additional information. The lion, as a creature of nature, must have two wings added to represent the kingdom of Babylon. Likewise, the bear is found in nature, but to symbolize meadow Persia, an unnatural ferocity must be denoted by the three ribs in its mouth. Similarly, the leopard is a natural creature, but to accurately represent Greece, four wings and three additional heads must be incorporated. However, nature offers no symbol capable of aptly illustrating the fourth kingdom. Consequently, the vision introduces a beast, the likes of which had never been seen before. A dreadful and terrifying creature with brass nails and iron teeth so barbarous, rapacious and fierce that it devoured, shattered and trampled its victims beneath its feet solely out of love for oppression. As astounding as all this was to the prophet, there was an even more remarkable feature that captured his attention. A little horn emerged and true to the nature of the beast from which it originated displaced three of its counterparts. I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Daniel 7, 21, 22. The extraordinary wrath of this little horn against the saints particularly captivated Daniel's attention. The emergence of the Ten Horns, or the division of Rome into ten kingdoms between AD 351 and 476, has already been discussed in commentary on Daniel 2.41. Since these horns represent kingdoms, the little horn must also symbolize a kingdom, albeit of a different nature, as it was distinct from the others. They were political kingdoms, and thus, 
One must inquire if any kingdom has arisen among the ten divisions of the Roman Empire since AD 476, which was dissimilar to them all. And if so, which one? The answer is the spiritual kingdom of the papacy. This power aligns with the symbol in every detail, as we shall observe in due course. Daniel saw this power waging war upon the saints. Has the papacy engaged in such a war? Countless martyrs affirm this fact. Consider the brutal persecution of the Waldenses, the Albigenses, and Protestants in general by the papal authority. In verse 22, three consecutive events seem to be presented. Gazing forward from the time when the little horn was at the height of its power to the ultimate conclusion of the protracted struggle between the saints and Satan with all his agents, Daniel identifies three significant events that serve as milestones along the path. The arrival of the Ancient of Days, referring to the position Jehovah assumes in the commencement of the judgment scene described in verses 9 and 10. The judgment that is bestowed upon the saints, indicating the period when the saints sit with Christ in judgment for a thousand years, following the first resurrection, Revelation 20, 1, 4, allocating to the wicked the punishment deserved for their transgressions. During this time, the martyrs will judge the formidable persecuting power, which, in their days of tribulation, pursued them like desert beasts and spilled their blood like water. The moment the saints inherit the kingdom, signifying their entry into the possession of the new earth. At this point, every last trace of the curse of sin and sinners, both root and branch, will have vanished, and the territory so long misgoverned by the wicked powers of earth, the adversaries of God's people, will be bequeathed to the righteous, to be held by them in perpetuity. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times, and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion, to consume and to destroy it unto the end. Daniel 7, 23, 26. Sufficient commentary has already been provided regarding the fourth beast, Rome, and the ten horns, or ten kingdoms, that emerged from this power. Our focus now shifts to the little horn, which warrants closer examination. As previously mentioned in the commentary on verse 8, the fulfillment of the prophecy concerning this horn is found in the rise and work of the papacy. Consequently, it is both intriguing and significant to investigate the causes that led to the development of this presumptuous power. The initial pastors, or bishops of Rome, received a degree of respect befitting the status of the city in which they resided. For the first few centuries of the Christian era, Rome stood as the largest, wealthiest, and most influential city in the world. It served as the center of empire and the capital of nations. Julian proclaimed, all the inhabitants of the earth belonged to her, while Claudian deemed her the fountain of laws. The Roman pastors reasoned, if Rome is the queen of cities, why should not her pastor be the king of bishops? Why should not the Roman church be the mother of Christendom? Why should not all nations be her children and her authority their sovereign law? According to Dobin, from whom we derive these quotations, it was not difficult for ambitious men to adopt this line of reasoning, and ambitious Rome did just that. Bishops throughout the Roman Empire took pleasure in bestowing upon the Bishop of Rome a portion of the honor their city received from the world's nations. At the outset, this tribute did not imply dependence. However, Dobin continues, usurped power grows like an avalanche. Admonitions, initially fraternal in nature, soon transformed into absolute commands from the pontiff. The Western bishops supported this encroachment by the Roman pastors, either out of jealousy of the Eastern bishops or because they preferred to submit to the supremacy of a pope rather than the authority of a temporal power. These influences surrounded the Bishop of Rome, propelling him swiftly toward the spiritual dominance of Christendom. Challenge of Arianism The fourth century was fated to see an obstacle obstruct the path of this ambitious vision. The prophecy had foretold that the power symbolized by the little horn would subdue three kings. 
in the rise and spread of Arianism at the beginning of the 4th century and the challenge it posed to papal supremacy, we find the catalysts that prompted the papal power to uproot three of the kingdoms of Western Rome. Arius, a parish priest from the ancient and influential Church of Alexandria, disseminated his doctrine worldwide, sparking a fierce debate within the Christian Church. Consequently, a general council was convened at Nicaea by Emperor Constantine in AD 325 to examine and rule upon its teachings. Arius argued that the Son was totally and essentially distinct from the Father. His belief in the literal sonship of Christ and the idea that a son must have a beginning sparked a significant controversy in the church. Arius argued that Jesus, as the Son of God, had a beginning and was begotten from the Father. This view was condemned by the council. The Catholic Church believes in the doctrine of the Trinity. Arius was subsequently exiled to Illyria and his followers were forced to accept the creed formulated during that gathering. However, the controversy was not so easily resolved. For centuries, it continued to unsettle the Christian world, with Arians becoming ardent adversaries of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. The proliferation of Arianism threatened to impede the progress of Catholicism, and it was clear that Italy and its illustrious capital under the control of a people with Arian beliefs would be detrimental to the supremacy of a Catholic bishop. Nevertheless, the prophecy had asserted that this horn, symbolizing the papacy, would ascend to paramount power, and in achieving this status, would subdue three kings. There has been some debate concerning the specific powers that were vanquished by the papacy during its ascent to power. In this context, Albert Barnes's observations appear relevant. In the chaos that ensued following the dissolution of the Roman Empire, and the incomplete accounts of the events transpiring during the rise of the papal power. It would not be surprising if it were difficult to find events explicitly documented that, in all respects, would be an accurate and absolute realization of the vision. Nevertheless, it is possible to discern the fulfillment of this prophecy with a fair degree of certainty in the history of the papacy. Joseph Mead postulates that the three kingdoms overthrown were the Greeks, Lombards, and Franks. Sir Isaac Newton, on the other hand, proposes they were the Exarchate of Ravenna, the Lombards, and the Senate and Dukedom of Rome. Thomas Newton raises significant objections to both of these propositions. The Franks could not have been one of these kingdoms, as they were never overthrown. The Lombards could not have been one, as they were never subjugated to the popes. Furthermore, Albert Barnes states, I do not find, indeed, that the kingdom of the Lombards was, as is commonly stated, among the number of the temporal sovereignties that became subject to the authority of the popes. The Senate and Dukedom of Rome could not have been one, as they never constituted one of the ten kingdoms, three of which were to be overthrown before the little horn. The primary difficulty in the interpretations offered by these eminent commentators may have arisen from their supposition that the prophecy concerning the exaltation of the papacy had not been fulfilled and could not have been until the Pope became a temporal prince. As a result, they sought to find a realization of the prophecy in the events leading to the Pope's temporal sovereignty. However, the prophecy in verses 24 and 25 seemingly refers not to the Pope's civil power, but to his authority to dominate the minds and consciences of individuals. The papacy achieved this position in A.D. 538, as will be demonstrated later. In verse 8, we see the image of the little horn forcing its way among the ten and aggressively uprooting three horns from before it. In verse 20, it is declared that the three horns fell from before it, as if conquered by it. In verse 24, we read that another king, representing the little horn, shall subdue three kings, horns, evidently by acts of force. It is posited with confidence that the three powers, or horns, uprooted, were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, and this position is anchored in reliable historical data. Odoacer, the leader of the Heruli, was the first barbarian to reign over the Romans. He seized the throne of Italy in AD 476. Regarding his religious beliefs, Gibbon states, like the rest of the barbarians, he had been instructed in the Arian heresy, but he revered the monastic and episcopal characters and the silence of the Catholics attests to the toleration which they enjoyed. Gibbon further notes, the Ostrogoths, the Burgundians, the Suevi, and the Vandals, who had listened to the eloquence of the Latin clergy, 
preferred the more intelligible lessons of their domestic teachers, and Arianism was adopted as the national faith of the warlike converts who were seated on the ruins of the Western Empire. This irreconcilable difference of religion was a perpetual source of jealousy and hatred, and the reproach of barbarian was embittered by the more odious epithet of heretic. The heroes of the North, who had submitted with some reluctance to believe that all their ancestors were in hell, were astonished and exasperated to learn that they themselves had only changed the mode of their eternal condemnation. The Arian doctrine significantly impacted the church at the time, as evident in the following excerpt. The entire immense Gothic population that descended upon the Roman Empire, insofar as it was Christian at all, adhered to the faith of the Alexandrian heretic. Our first Teutonic version of the scriptures was by an Arian missionary, Ulfilas. The first conqueror of Rome, Alaric, the first conqueror of Africa, Genseric, were Arians. Theodoric the Great, king of Italy and hero of the Nibelungen line, was an Arian. The empty space in his grand tomb at Ravenna bears witness to the vengeance that the Orthodox exacted upon his memory when they triumphed and tore down the porphyry vase in which his Arian subjects had enshrined his ashes. Ranker remarks, however, the church inevitably encountered numerous difficulties and found herself in a completely altered situation. A pagan people took possession of Britain. Arian kings seized the majority of the remaining West, while the Lombards, long adherents of Arianism and dangerous and hostile neighbors, established a powerful sovereignty on the very doorstep of Rome. Meanwhile, the Roman bishops, surrounded on all sides, exerted themselves with the prudence and persistence that have remained their distinguishing traits to regain control at least in their patriarchal diocese. Machiavelli observes, It is worth noting that almost all the wars which the northern barbarians waged in Italy were incited by the pontiffs, and the hordes that inundated the country were generally summoned by them. The relationship between these Aryan kings and the Pope is demonstrated in the following testimony, from Mosheim's church history. On the other hand, it is certain from various highly credible records that both the emperors and the nations in general were far from willing to bear patiently the yoke of servitude that the See of Rome was imperiously imposing upon the Christian church. The Gothic princes set limits to the power of the Bishop of Rome in Italy, allowed no one to ascend the pontificate without their approval, and reserved for themselves the right to judge the legality of each new election. An instance substantiating this statement appears in the history of Odoaca, the first Arian king mentioned above. Upon Pope Simplicius's death in AD 483, the clergy and people assembled to elect a new pope. Suddenly, Basilius Odoaca's lieutenant arrived at the assembly, expressed surprise that they would undertake the appointment of a successor to the deceased pope without him, declared in the king's name that all that had been done was null and void and ordered the election to start anew. At the same time, Zeno, the Eastern Emperor and friend of the Pope, was eager to drive Odoacer out of Italy, a task he soon saw accomplished without his intervention. Theodoric had ascended the throne of the Ostrogothic kingdom in Moesia and Pannonia. Being on amicable terms with Zeno, he wrote to him, explaining that it was impossible to contain his Goths within the impoverished province of Pannonia and requested permission to lead them to a more favorable region to conquer and inhabit. Zeno granted him permission to march against Odoacer and take possession of Italy. Consequently, after a five-year war, the Herulian kingdom in Italy was overthrown, Odoacer was treacherously murdered, and Theodoric established his Ostrogoths in the Italian peninsula. As previously mentioned, he was an Arian, and the law of Odoacer subjecting the election of the Pope to the approval of the king remained in effect. This particular episode demonstrates the extent to which the papacy was subject to the Arian king's authority. In AD 523, with the Catholics in the east persecuting the Arians, Theodoric summoned Pope John and commanded him, If the emperor, Justin, the predecessor of Justinian, does not deem it appropriate to revoke the edict against those of my persuasion, i.e. the Arians, I shall issue a similar edict against those of his, i.e. the Catholics, and ensure its rigorous enforcement. Those who do not embrace the faith of Nice are heretics to him, and those who do, heretics to me. Whatever excuses or justifies his severity towards the former will do the same for mine towards the latter. 
I shall therefore require you to travel to Constantinople and protest, in both my name and your own, against the aggressive measures that court has so recklessly embraced. You have the power to sway the emperor's decisions, and until you have achieved that, and the Catholics, Theodoric refers to the Arians here, are allowed to freely practice their religion and regain their churches, you must not contemplate returning to Italy. The Pope, thus expressly ordered by the Arian Emperor to abstain from Italian soil until he fulfilled the King's will, could hardly aspire to any form of supremacy until that authority was removed. The Papal faction's sentiments towards Theodoric can be ascertained by the retribution exacted upon his memory. They desecrated his tomb by removing the vessel containing the ashes that his Arian followers had enshrined. Baronius eloquently expresses these feelings, denouncing Theodoric as a cruel barbarian, a barbarous tyrant, and an impious Arian. Meanwhile, the Catholics in Italy experienced the constraining force of an Arian king while enduring brutal persecution from the Arian Vandals in Africa. Eliot observes, the Vandal kings were not only Arians, but also persecutors of the Catholics. In Sardinia and Corsica under the Roman Episcopate, we may presume, as well as in Africa. In AD 533, Justinian embarked on his Vandal and Gothic wars, seeking the support of the Pope and the Catholic party. He issued a momentous decree to establish the Pope as the head of all churches, marking the beginning of papal supremacy in AD 538. Throughout the African and Italian campaigns, Catholics universally welcomed Belisarius, Justinian's general, and his army as their saviors. However, such a decree could not be executed until the Arian obstructions were removed. A turning point occurred when the military campaigns in Africa and Italy saw Belisarius's victorious legions deliver a decisive blow to Arianism, resulting in its ultimate defeat. Procopius recounts that Justinian initiated the African war to alleviate the plight of the Christians, Catholics. Despite the palace prefect's near success in dissuading him, a dream encouraged Justinian to proceed, assuring him that by aiding the Christians, he would topple the Vandal's power. Mosheim states, the Greeks who had adopted the decrees of the Council of Nice, i.e. the Catholics, persecuted and oppressed the Arians wherever they could exert their influence and authority. Conversely, the Nicenians suffered harsh treatment from their adversaries, the Arians, particularly in Africa and Italy, where they acutely experienced the Arian power and its bitter retribution. Nevertheless, Arianism's triumphs were fleeting and its prosperous days were wholly eclipsed when the Vandals were expelled from Africa and the Goths from Italy by Justinian's forces. Eliot summarizes this period by identifying three prominent adversaries that were vanquished to pave the way for the Pope I might cite three that were eradicated from before the Pope out of the list first given visit. The Heruli under Odoasa, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. Upon examining the historical testimonies aforementioned, we find it irrefutable that the three horns plucked up were the powers delineated as the Heruli in AD 493, the Vandals in 534, and ultimately the Ostrogoths in 553. Nevertheless, the latter's effective opposition to Justinian's decree waned when they were expelled from Rome by Belisarius in 583, as expounded on page 127. The prophecy of the little horn, foretelling that it would speak great words against the Most High, has been regrettably realized throughout the chronicles of the pontiffs. They have either sought or allowed the attribution of titles so hyperbolic and blasphemous that even celestial beings would pale in comparison. Lucius Ferraris, in his Prompta Bibliotheca, which the Catholic Encyclopedia extols as a veritable encyclopedia of religious knowledge and a precious mine of information, proclaims in its article on the Pope that the Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the Vicar of God. The Pope alone is deservedly called by the name Most Holy, because he alone is the Vicar of Christ, who is the fountain and source and fullness of all holiness. He is likewise the Divine Monarch and Supreme Emperor and King of Kings. Hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown, as King of Heaven and of Earth, and of the lower regions. The Pope is as it were God on Earth, sole Sovereign of the Faithful of Christ, Chief King of Kings, having plenitude of power, 
to whom has been entrusted by the omnipotent God direction, not only of the earthly, but also of the heavenly kingdom. The Pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even divine laws. During the fourth session of the Fifth Lateran Council, Christopher Marcellus, in an oration to the Pope, proclaimed, Thou art the shepherd, thou art the physician, thou art the director, thou art the husbandman. Finally, thou art another God on earth. Adam Clark further elaborates on verse 25. He shall speak as if he were God. So St. Jerome quotes from Symmachus, To none can this apply so well or so fully as to the popes of Rome. They have assumed infallibility, which belongs only to God. They profess to forgive sins, which belongs only to God. They profess to open and shut heaven, which belongs only to God. They profess to be higher than all the kings of the earth, which belongs only to God. And they go beyond God in pretending to loose whole nations from their oath of allegiance to their kings, when such kings do not please them. And they go against God when they give indulgences for sin. This is the worst of all blasphemies. Regarding the prophecy of the little horn, to wear out the saints of the Most High, only cursory historical inquiry is needed to demonstrate that Rome, during the eras of antiquity and the Dark Ages, relentlessly pursued a path of destruction against the Church of God. Ample evidence attests to the fact that prior to and after the monumental reformation, wars, crusades, massacres, inquisitions, and all manner of persecutions were employed to subjugate all to the Roman yoke. The chronicles of medieval persecution are harrowing and distressing, causing a reluctance to dwell upon the intricate details. However, to properly comprehend this passage, it is imperative to revisit some events that transpired during these woeful times. Albert Barnes, in his commentary on this passage, observes, Can anyone doubt that this is true of the papacy? The Inquisition, the persecutions of the Waldenses, the ravages of the Duke of Alva, the fires of Smithfield, the tortures at Goa indeed, the whole history of the papacy may be appealed to in proof that this is applicable to that power. Indeed, the slightest acquaintance with the history of the papacy will convince anyone that what is here said of making war with the saints, verse 21, and wearing out the saints of the Most High, verse 25, is strictly applicable to that power and will accurately describe its history. These accounts are corroborated by the testimony of W.E.H. Lecky, who asserts that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a complete knowledge of history. These atrocities were not perpetrated in the brief paroxysms of a reign of terror or by the hands of obscure sectaries, but were inflicted by a triumphant Church with every circumstance of solemnity and deliberation. The fact that victims were frequently handed over to civil authorities does not absolve the Church of responsibility. The Church presided over decisions concerning heresy and then transferred the offenders to the secular court. In those times, however, secular power was merely an instrument wielded by the Church under its control and at its behest. When the Church delivered prisoners to the executioners, it employed the following formula with fiendish sarcasm. And we do leave and deliver thee to the secular arm, and to the power of the secular court. But at the same time, do most earnestly beseech that court so to moderate its sentence as not to touch thy blood, or to put thy life in any danger. Subsequently, as intended, the hapless victims of papal animosity were swiftly executed. Lepicia's testimony is pertinent in this context. The civil power can only punish the crime of unbelief, in the manner, and to the extent that the crime is judicially made known to it by ecclesiastical persons, skilled in the doctrine of the faith. But the Church, taking cognizance by herself of the crime of unbelief, can by herself decree the sentence of death, yet not execute it, but she hands over the execution of it to the secular arm. The spurious claims propagated by some Catholics, asserting that their Church has never executed dissenters, have been categorically refuted by one of their own eminent writers, Cardinal Bellarmine, who was born in Tuscany in 1542. Nearly canonized as a saint posthumously in 1621, Bellarmine's contributions to the church were substantial. During a debate, he inadvertently admitted the truth. Responding to Luther's assertion that the church, referring to the true church, never burned heretics, Bellarmine, interpreting it as referring to the Roman Catholic Church, 
retorted. This argument proves not the sentiment, but the ignorance or impudence of Luther, for as almost an infinite number were either burned or otherwise put to death, for that heretics were often burned by the church, may be proved by adducing a few from many examples. The esteemed Alfred Baudrillard, rector of the Catholic Institute of Paris, provides a poignant observation regarding the church's approach to heresy. He states, when confronted by heresy, she does not content herself with persuasion. Arguments of an intellectual and moral order appear to her insufficient, and she has recourse to force, to corporal punishment, to torture. This powerful institution established tribunals such as the Inquisition, allied with state laws, and if necessary, encouraged crusades or religious wars. All of these actions, ostensibly driven by a horror of blood, ultimately led to the church urging secular powers to spill it in a manner that could be deemed less frank and more odious than if the church herself were to do so directly. Particularly during the 16th century, the church's approach to Protestants was marked by a propensity for violence. Instead of focusing on moral reform, education, or conversion through eloquent and holy missionaries, the church was responsible for igniting the funeral pyres of the Inquisition in Italy, the Low Countries, and especially Spain. Furthermore, in France under Francis the Firm and Henry II, and in England under Mary Tudor, the church actively tortured heretics. Throughout the latter half of the 16th century and the first half of the 17th century, the church not only encouraged religious wars in France and Germany, but actively supported them. Pope Martin Thave's letter to the King of Poland during his papacy from 1417 to 1431 reveals a chilling directive. Know that the interest of the Holy See and those of your crown make it a duty to exterminate the Hussites, burn, massacre, make deserts everywhere, for nothing could be more agreeable to God or more useful to the cause of kings than the extermination of the Hussites. This directive exemplifies the church's position on heresy. It was not to be tolerated but eradicated. It is well documented that pagan Rome persecuted the early Christian church, resulting in the deaths of an estimated three million Christians during the first three centuries of the Christian era. However, early Christians prayed for the continuance of imperial Rome as they knew that when this form of government ceased, another, far worse persecuting power would emerge, one that would wear out the saints of the Most High, as foretold in prophecy. Pagan Rome might have slain infants while sparing mothers, but Papal Rome's cruelty extended to both mothers and infants indiscriminately. No age, sex, or condition in life was safe from its merciless wrath. The little horn was also prophesied to think to change times and laws. The question arises, which laws and whose? Certainly not the laws of other earthly governments, for it was not unusual for one power to change the laws of another when it could exert its dominion. The times and laws in question pertain to those that this power would only think to change, but would not actually have the ability to alter. These are the laws of the Most High, to whom the saints belong, those who have suffered at the hands of this power. The papacy, indeed, has even attempted this. The papacy has taken the liberty to restructure the Decalogue, combining the first and second commandments into one, and dividing the tenth into two separate edicts. Consequently, the Ninth Commandment forbids coveting a neighbor's spouse, while the Tenth prohibits coveting a neighbor's property, thus maintaining the total count of Ten Commandments. Although the complete text of the Second Commandment is preserved in the Roman Catholic Bible and the Roman Catechism endorsed by the Council of Trent, meticulous explanations are provided to clarify that images and likenesses, except those of God Himself, are not forbidden by this commandment as long as they serve the sole purpose of venerating the virtues of saints and not worshipping them as deities, which is explicitly prohibited. This principle also applies to the relics of saints, such as ashes and bones, as well as representations of angels. Regarding the fourth commandment, which is numbered as the third in the Roman Catholic Church's arrangement, the most authoritative catechism within the Church upholds the entire commandment and advocates for the meticulous observance of the Sabbath in both personal and public worship as a sacred privilege and obligation. Nevertheless, the Church argues that the specific day designated for Sabbath observance was tied to Jewish ceremonial practices which were abolished with the advent of Christ.
justifications are subsequently provided for observing the Sabbath on the first day of the week, commonly known as Sunday. In support of this brief account on the altering of times and laws by the papacy, we present evidence from the most authoritative catechism within the Roman Catholic Church. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, the authority of this catechism is higher than that of any other, but is of course not on a level with that of the canons and decrees of a council. Before quoting the text, it is important to note that within the Roman Catholic Church's governance, the canons and decrees of an ecumenical church council hold both official and supreme authority. The Council of Trent, which convened in Trent, Italy, from 1545 to 1563, is a prominent example of such a council. As this council was convened to counter the expanding influence of the Protestant Reformation and extensively addressed church doctrines and practices, it formally decreed, the Holy Synod commands all bishops to explain the sacraments according to the form to be prescribed by the Holy Synod for all the sacraments in a catechism, which bishops will take care to have faithfully translated into the vulgar tongue and expounded to the people by the parish priests. In compliance with this command, a catechism was composed in Latin for the Roman Catholic Church by St. Charles Borromeo and other theologians in 1566. It was published in Rome by the Vatican Congregation for the propagation of the faith under the title Catechismus Romanus Ex Decreto Sacrosancti Concilii Tridentini Jusu S. P. of Five Pontificis Maximi Editus or in English Roman Catechism according to the decree of the Sacred Council of Trent published by order of St. Pius V, Pontifex Maximus. This work was translated into English by Very Reverend J. Donovan, D.D., domestic prelate to His Holiness Gregory XVI, and published in Dublin with a preface dated June 10, 1829, bearing the title Catechism, according to the decree of the Council of Trent, edited by the command of our most illustrious Lord Pius V. From the fifth edition of the Roman Catechism published in Rome in 1796, we cite the following from Donovan's English translation concerning the fourth Catholic Third Commandment. The Church of God deemed it fitting that the religious celebration of the Sabbath should be transferred to the Lord's Day, meaning Sunday. For on this day, light first shone upon the world. Furthermore, by the resurrection of our Redeemer on that day, who opened for us the gateway to eternal life, our existence was summoned from darkness into light. Hence, the apostles wished to designate it as the Lord's Day. We also find in the sacred scriptures that this day was revered because it marked the commencement of the world's creation and the Holy Ghost was bestowed upon the apostles on that day. The papacy's declaration that the Roman Catholic Church altered the observance of the Sabbath from the seventh day, as stipulated in the Decalogue, to the first day of the week, which it mistakenly refers to as the Lord's Day, is a significant matter. The apostles are accused of initiating the change from the seventh day to the first, yet no evidence from the scriptures is provided to support this claim. In fact, there is no such evidence to be found. All the reasons presented for this change are solely based on human and ecclesiastical conjecture. The testimony provided above sufficiently demonstrates how the papacy has sought to change times and laws. Further details on how later Roman Catholic catechisms assert that the Church made this change and even challenge Protestants for accepting and observing it can be found in our commentary on the Mark of the Beast in Revelation 13. In order to gain a deeper understanding of this Sabbath modification, it is beneficial to examine other reasons provided by the papacy for the change, aside from the erroneous claim that it was instituted by the Apostles. The same Roman Catechism referenced earlier attempts to clarify how the Sabbath commandment differs from the others in the Decalogue. It is evident that the other precepts of the Decalogue pertain to the natural law, are perpetual and unchangeable. Hence, although the Mosaic law has been abrogated, Christians continue to observe all commandments contained in the two tables, not because Moses mandated it, but because they align with the natural law which compels individuals to adhere to them. However, the commandment concerning the sanctification of the Sabbath, when considered in terms of the designated time for observance, is not immutable, but subject to change, and is not a moral law, but rather a ceremonial one. It is not a fundamental tenet of natural law, 
for we are not naturally inclined or instructed to offer external worship to God on this specific day over any other. Instead, the Sabbath was observed by the Israelites following their liberation from Pharaoh's bondage. The reader should be reminded that the Ten Commandments were inscribed by God's finger on stone tablets, whereas the ceremonial laws were documented by Moses in a book. Additionally, the Decalogue was written prior to the issuance of the ceremonial laws to Moses. Is it appropriate to accuse God of incorporating a ceremonial command within the moral laws and leave it to an audacious ecclesiastical institution to rectify this? The rationale behind observing the seventh-day Sabbath, as stated in the commandment itself, is that the Creator rested on that day and designated it as a commemoration of His creation, without any suggestion that it foreshadowed future events in Christ, to whom all ceremonial ordinances pointed. One final excerpt from the Roman Catechism warrants attention. The Apostles therefore decided to dedicate the first of the seven days to divine worship, which they named the Lord's Day. St. John mentions the Lord's Day in his Apocalypse, Revelation 1.10, and the Apostle instructs that collections be made on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16.2, which as St. Chrysostom interprets is the Lord's Day, indicating that even the Lord's Day was observed as a holy day in the Church. The allegation that the Apostles altered the day of the Sabbath is not only fallacious, but also presents the notion that conducting one's business affairs on the first day of the week is a reason for observing it as the Sabbath, in contradiction to God's immutable law. This quotation also unveils the reliance on the interpretations and practices of the Fathers, such as Saint Chrysostom, rather than the Scriptures themselves as evidence for the change of the Sabbath from God's law to Sunday. It is particularly pertinent for Protestant clergy and laity to contemplate the following observation. The Roman Catechism, commissioned by Pope Pius V around the mid-16th century, essentially contains every argument used by modern-day Protestants to justify the shift of the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week. Consider the following points. They presume, without evidence, that the seventh-day Sabbath was part of the ceremonial law, despite being at the very core of the moral law inscribed by God's own finger, and therefore abolished in Christ. They audaciously assert that the apostles decreed the first day of the week be observed instead of the seventh, referring to John's use of the term Lord's Day in Revelation 1.10, even though the only day God ever consecrated as holy and claimed as his own by resting on it was the seventh day of the fourth commandment. They maintain that the Sabbath law of rest aligns with the law of nature, necessitating a cessation of labor and a period for reflection and worship. However, they argue that the time of its observance is susceptible to change, since, according to their reasoning, it does not belong to the moral but ceremonial law, and was thus altered by the apostles, the fathers, and the church to the first day of the week. Their rationale for such a change includes the fact that light first shone upon the world on the first day of the week. The resurrection of Christ occurred on that day. The Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles on the same day of the week, and Paul advised Christians to calculate their business accounts and set aside a portion for the Lord on the first day of the week. All these reasons are of human invention and lack scriptural authority for such a change. The only reasons given by the Creator and Lord of the Sabbath are that He created the world in six days, rested on the seventh, and designated that day for holy use on the same permanent and unalterable basis as He created all other things on the other days of creation week. Protestants may be unaware that their defense of the Sunday Sabbath employs Roman Catholic arguments from the Catechism of the Council of Trent, published in the 16th century. However, every argument mentioned above can be found in that work. Our plea to every Protestant is to fully break away from the papacy, adhering to the Bible and the Bible alone in both belief and practice. The phrase, a time and times and the dividing of time, encompasses the saints, times and laws mentioned earlier. The question then arises as to how long this power would maintain control over them. A time equates to one year, two times denote two years, and the dividing of time, or half a time, represents half a year. Thus, we have three and a half years for the duration of this power. In the context of symbolic prophecy, this time is not literal, but symbolic. The subsequent inquiry concerns the period signified by the three and a half years of prophetic time. 
The Bible provides the principle that a day in symbolic prophecy represents a year. Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14, 34. Following this principle, a day in symbolic prophecy represents a year. Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14, 34. Thus, when interpreting the three and a half years of prophetic time, we must convert the symbolic days into literal years. In this case, the three and a half years, or twelve sixty days, translate to twelve sixty literal years. Applying this day for a year principle to the prophetic time frame in question, we deduce that the power described in the prophecy would hold sway over the saints, times, and laws for twelve sixty literal years. This interpretation aligns with other prophetic passages found in the scriptures, such as Revelation 12, 6 and 12, 14, which also refer to a period of 1260 days, or years, in a symbolic context. In 1844, the judgment commenced its divine labor within the celestial sanctuary, verse 10. Verse 11 reveals that due to the great words which the horn spoke, the beast met its demise. On December 8, 1854, the Pope declared the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. In 1870, Victor Emmanuel's armies stripped the Pope of his temporal authority, coinciding with the 20th Ecumenical Council's proclamation of papal infallibility when speaking ex cathedra, as the shepherd and teacher of all Christians defining doctrines concerning faith or morals. Despite the escalating reverence bestowed upon the Bishop of Rome by the clergy, the Pope's temporal power was utterly vanquished. Consequently, popes sequestered themselves within the Vatican's confines in Rome, akin to prisoners until the 1929 Concordat with Italy, which reinstated his dominion over Vatican City, a modest segment of the Eternal City. And the kingdom and dominion, and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me. But I kept the matter in my heart. Daniel 7, 27, 28 Upon witnessing the somber and desolate tableau of the church under papal subjugation, the prophet is granted the opportunity to once again cast his gaze upon the resplendent era of the saints' repose, during which they shall inherit the kingdom, eternally liberated from all oppressive forces. In this malevolent world, Beset by the tumult and tyranny of earthly governments and the abhorrent acts committed within the land, how could God's children maintain their fortitude if not for the anticipation of the divine kingdom and their Lord's return? Their unwavering conviction in the imminent fulfillment of these promises provides solace and strength. As the visions of the prophet Daniel begin to dim, the echoes of the beasts still resonate in our minds. The lion with eagle's wings, the bear, the four-headed leopard, the terrible beast, each one a symbol, a prophecy, a glimpse into the unfathomable depths of time and power. We have journeyed alongside Daniel and have unraveled the mysteries of the kingdoms of men and their fate. Each beast, each symbol, each dream, a testament to the grandeur of divine providence. But the journey is far from over. As one book closes, another opens. We stand on the precipice of a new revelation a revelation steeped in prophecy and written in the language of symbols, the revelation of John. The beasts of Daniel have revealed the past and present, but the beasts of Revelation, they hold the keys to the future. The dragon, the beast from the sea, the beast from the earth, each one a harbinger of what is yet to come. Our next adventure takes us into the heart of the Apocalypse, Revelation chapter 13. There, we will continue our quest to decipher the signs, to understand the prophecies, and to unlock the divine wisdom that governs the course of history.